Yogis have actually been doing this for over three and a half thousand years. You know, they didn't know it was DMT that was being released, but they knew that they were connecting from the pineal or from the third eye, as they call it, and the crown chakra, and they were expanding. Mm -hmm. And they were connecting something much, much greater than themselves. Desire is the key to unhappiness. So if we turn it on a set rather than what makes you happy, what makes you unhappy is desire. And so if you want something to be the way that it is not right now, then you're going to have an unhappiness. Welcome to this new episode and today I am here with uh, Adrian. How are you Adrian? I'm great, thank you Luca, thank you for having me. Good to see you. Lovely, lovely indeed. So Adrian is a meditation teacher, he's also a holder of uh, DMT breath work and ecstatic dance. And I think uh, your mantra or keyword is happiness. Yes, right? yeah, my, my mantra, my mission on life is live long and be happy. Uh, and I think most people want to live long and be happy. Not many people want to live short and be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a few. <laughs> you might be surprised. <laughs> but yeah, I want to live long and be happy, and most of my clients do, and so that's, that's my general goal. That sounds lovely. Okay, so my first question for you is, uh, what is your story in life up until now? Yeah, so I'm British Iraqi, and I was raised in Spain. So I'm really a mix of all these different kind of cultures and backgrounds. Grew up there, uh, went to university in the UK, and then I worked in different, uh, in different roles across the UK, in Hong Kong, in Italy. Um, and then at the same time, I had this kind of, uh, in my background, always looking beyond, always asking questions. So I was doing like the regular corporate career, climbing the ladder. Um, but in the back of my mind, it was like, there must be more, you know? And so I would ask these questions. Along the way, I had a few breakdowns where, you know, my world fell apart. Maybe I lost my job or I lost my relationship or all at the same time. But every time I went down, I would search and I'd find answers in yoga and meditation. And then I would bring myself up. And so then I would do contracts for maybe 18 months, two years. And then I'd take a few months off and I would go and seek and then go back and then come back and seek, go back. See, and, and, and then slowly the time working in these more traditional careers would reduce and the time uh, in this kind of other alternative lifestyle um, would just increase and increase and increase. And it's interesting because I keep coming back to this island. I came to this island for the full moon uh, when I was just, you know, backpacker in my early 20s. And then I grew up with the island. Um, and then this island has amazing party scene, of course, but as you get older and a bit deeper, you find more of the, the seeking. And so I think that's, what, that's what's happened with me. And now it's a dream to be able to live here full time and practice what I preach. So. Cool. And uh, were you always supported in uh, sort of your uh, lifestyle of uh, working and living? Uh, there were some challenges there with, uh, you know, of course, the mainstream society wants you to be settled to a certain extent. Yeah, I think, I think I had to split it up like that. Uh, but uh, even when I was in a settled position, so even when I was in London or when I was in Hong Kong, I would still have a practice, a yoga practice or a meditation practice. I would still be teaching. So I would still, I could have the two go at the same time. I think the problem lies, in, I love Paradise Islands. I mean, I grew up in, in south of Spain, which is beautiful, sunny. And I think that always had in my mind that I need to live in the sunshine and on the coast. Um, and so, of course, that's why there's not so many coastal cities that have amazing beaches like in Copenhagen. But I think COVID helped a lot, mm -hmm. actually, to accelerate that journey because I was able to then work remotely uh, and be here in places like Bali and other sunshiny places. And then when COVID finished, I realized, yeah, actually, I'm done. I'm not going to go back to the city anymore. Okay, so COVID was more the 
pivotal time when you decided to get on to this full-time lifestyle now eh, where you're based in Kopangan and of course you do meditation and your practices, right? Exactly. That's lovely. It very nice, very nice. And uh, well, I suppose we can delve into meditation now. When did you start a sort of learning and then teaching meditation? Yeah, so my journey started um, when I, well, the first thing I ever got, I got a book from my library at school. So I think I must have been 14 or 15. And it said like, learn yoga in a weekend, which <laughs> is quite a, a big task. I remember picking it up off the shelf. And I was like, what is this? I'd never heard of the word yoga. And I was looking through it. And then, you know, people are doing all these crazy postures. And so that was like the first time that I kind of got into it. And I remember as a kid doing a Nadi Shodana, you know, alternate left, right mm. breathing. And then I kind of left it. But I really got into it at university when I started doing Taekwondo, which is a Korean martial art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I got very, very deep in, in the Taekwondo. And um, I was doing it five days a week, very intensely. Um, I was entered in competitions up and down the UK. I would travel and compete. I won a few things. And um, what for me, I mean, there's a lot of kicking and it's a very physical practice. It's a martial art, so it's self-defense. But as a part of that, it's a discipline. And there's a lot of mind control and there's a lot of energy work. And, you know, we're smashing through these uh, wooden boards, for example. It's not a physical practice. It's an energetic practice. Mm -hmm. So all of the, that was, I think, my foundation. Because then when I came here, I remember I came for the full moon. And then I went to the sanctuary on the other side of the island. I saw this, like, holistic place, healthy... And I thought, oh, that's a great place for the hangover. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to party on Hadrin Beach. And then I went the next day to the sanctuary, have juices and all this detox. And then I went to a meditation class there. And I was like, this is not meditation. This is Taekwondo. And then I suddenly realized that the part of Taekwondo that I really, really loved was the meditation part. Mm. And that really then set me on my journey because I thought, actually, this is a lot more interesting. I mean, I enjoyed the party. <laughs> Who doesn't enjoy a good party? But I thought, this is actually a lot more interesting. There's much more going on here. And when I got back to London, I went and Googled yoga near me. Um, and I was very, very lucky that j just because it was geographically the closest place to where I lived mm -hmm. was the Satyananda Center. Okay, wow. Amazing woman, Swami Pragyamurti. And she, I mean, the story about her is incredible. She, she went to India in the 60s. She was doing acid, <laughs> doing crazy things. And she met Swami Satyananda, mm -hmm. who wrote the Orange Book, which is like the Bible of yoga, mm -hmm. uh, Asana Pranayama Mudravanda. And he made her a Swami on the spot. He said, I had a vision of you. I had a vision of 40 people that will become swamis. You are one of them. You must go back to London, become a swami. And they shaved her head. At the, I mean, she was actually like a, a model. She had this long hair. They shaved her head. They sent her back to London. She got rid of all her clothes, just wore orange robes. And she was literally less than a kilometer from my house. Wow. Teaching in her attic and in her front room. So my introduction to yoga was with one of the most uh, revered swamis. Um, and it was really funny because yoga, as we know it in the West, is very vinyasa, very physical, you know, uh, and uh, mainly feminine. You know, a lot of women doing it in the cities. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the whole culture is around it. So when I was saying to people, I'm doing yoga, they would be like, what are you doing? You're going around in tights and doing this. And I'm like, no, we're actually not doing so much of... We didn't do any vinyasa. It was a very, very pure hatha okay. with a lot of meditation, a lot of, you know, staring at candle flames, a lot of yoga nidra, a lot of pranayama, so much pranayama. Mm. And so I would, I would then... I was so immersed in her class and her teachings that I was not so aware of, like, this, I guess, normalized Western yoga. Mm -hmm. And I remember her herself saying, like, all this power yoga. She's like, I don't even know what a power yoga class is. I mean, the, the lady's incredible. She's like 75 at the time. She's like, I don't even know this power yoga. She's oh, like, hot no. yoga. <laughs> yeah, hot yoga as well. I was like, what is hot yoga? So I was really, it was only afterwards when I actually started doing more of a physical practice. And I would go, I actually did some Bikram. Um, almost as an antidote because I started boxing. Okay, okay. And, um, and I needed something for my muscles. Yeah. Uh, Bikram was like the ideal antidote 
you know, after you, you have a quite explosive movement and then you have a nice stretch out. Yeah. And then I, and I looked around at these yoga guys and I was like, yeah, this isn't, this is good. And I'm, I never want to um, sure. downplay or belittle vinyasa yoga, Bikram yoga, oh. power yoga, all the rest of it. I, no, there is definitely power and strength in those practices. But um, a teacher of mine in India once said, he said, if, if yoga is your whole body, asana is like the, your fingernail. Yeah. And so, so many people do yoga and don't know that there's like a whole, it's like entering a cave and you just go the first couple of meters and then go, well, it's dark in here and we go back out. And behind it is this whole thing. Sure, for sure, for sure. So I was very lucky and that's how I found my way into yoga with this very fortunate to have met her. And then through some of my breaks in my career, I went and did deep teacher trainings. I found another incredible teacher, a guy called Peter Clifford, who used to teach on this island. Uh, he's from Byron Bay. He spent 55 years in the Himalayas learning yoga. And he sat with Ayenga, Desika Cha, Patabi Joyce, uh, Mohan, uh, another guy called Shankara. So he, he had the superstars of yoga teach him and for 55 years, and then he distilled that into a very presentable format for the West. Okay, okay, okay. So he did the hard work in some ways, and then I learned so much from him, and it was on the 19th day of that teacher training, I looked in the mirror, and I s said to myself, my God, you've learned so many amazing things. They help you, but you know so many people with similar problems. This would help them. And I went back to Peter and I said, Peter, this stuff, it works. I could really help people. I need to teach this. And he looked at me like, yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's the point. That's what a yeah. teacher training is. Like you, you can't, you know, and I think because before that you don't, you're doing it. I, I was doing it for my own personal practice yeah, yeah. to go deep. And also you don't necessarily have the confidence to teach. Of course. Um, and you think, well, you know, what do I know? What, what can I give to others? But at that point, you, I don't know, something happened where I realized a shift in my own mind, a shift in my body. And I thought, actually, no, I'm starting to get this. And I'm starting to get why, why it's so valuable. And instead of it being, oh, I do a little bit of a yoga and people think that's a nice little hobby. It's like, no, this, this thing can really help. This thing will improve your life. You know, and you look at it, right? You look at, I almost look at everybody now and see how stressed they are or like how little sleep they're getting or how depressed they are or how a lack of control of their emotions they have, you know? And you suddenly go, but I know something that would really work for you. And some people are open to it and some people are not, of course. You don't, people have to find their own way. But I just feel very lucky to have a whole broad range of techniques that if people do want to come and ask about them, they can solve these problems. Yeah, sounds great indeed. Um, that is yoga in a nutshell. Mm. You can start in the gym, you can do the asana, yeah. the, fin the vinyasa. But sooner or later, you know, I think a lot of people get into the pranayama and then uh, into more meditation, advanced meditations. And then maybe people are called to go to India yeah. or they come to Kopangan, they do something longer. You know, it's, uh, it's a journey and it never ends, right? That's the beauty yeah, of yoga yeah, is that yeah. when you start, <laughs> it becomes a hobby, it becomes a passion. And then it's 100% your lifestyle, uh, you know, with yoga. And uh, yeah, the way you see the world can change, the level of awareness of your body, your breath, other people, energy. And you said in the martial art, yeah. you learned energy early on. So do you have an like, energetic practice that you teach as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm bring, on Wednesday, I'm actually teaching it uh, for uh, the public. In, uh, it's called a Yoga Nyasa. And we're doing it because it's International Yoga Day. Yeah. And that is, it's such a powerful practice. You do it on your own. You can do it with other people. And you really modify the energy in all of your chakras. Uh, and then you push it out to the whole body and it changes everything. And then you can, with a partner, you, you can pass on your energy to them or they can bring their energy back up to you. And okay. so it's, a, it's an incredible practice. I don't usually teach it because you need to be quite an advanced level. It's not just for everybody. But they asked me at Orion, can you do something really special for International Yoga Day? And I thought, let's do that. Um, but yeah, in my own personal practice, I'm doing a lot of energy meditations. I'm always up and down uh, on the chakras. I'm always sending the energy out. And 
I can't start my day without it, you know? If, if I, I used to be a person, I'd have a cup of coffee in the morning, I'd be like, don't talk to me till my cup. <laughs> don't talk to me till I've had my <laughs> coffee. Luckily, I've given that caffeine addiction up, and now I'm almost like, don't talk to me till I've had my meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me about DMT. What yep. is DMT, and how can you use the breath to stimulate uh, the release of DMT? If, yep. if that's a thing you do, right? That is a thing I do. So <laughs> one of my signature classes is the DMT breath work. Uh, we're doing it at Orion at the moment, and it's been absolute incredible success. It's actually their most popular workshop. Uh, and we're having amazing feedback from it. DMT is a mo DMT is very on trend. Yeah, it's like everywhere is DMT, ayahuasca, smoking DMT. We do it completely naturally. It's a molecule. It's produced in the pineal gland. So uh, the yogis call it the third eye. Uh, but even if you're not a yogi, this eyebrow center in the third in the pineal gland. It's basically, we draw a line from the crown down and from the eyebrow center back where those two lines cross, the pineal gland. Straight away, there's something interesting there. You know, why is this thing being produced in the center of the brain? It's quite prominent. It's, it therefore must be something going on. Now the research, and there's not so much research on it because it's fairly new. 1931, they discovered it. Okay. It's a scientific discovery, so it's new in terms of molecular structures. But uh, there's a chap called Dr. Rick Strassman. He wrote the DMT Spirit Molecule book, or DMT the Spirit Molecule. And he hypothesizes that this connects us with something greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because it really, DMT, it shows up at various points in your life. But for most of the time, your pineal gland is not produced in DMT. When you die, you get a lot of DMT. Mm -hmm. It just floods the body. And so he was saying, you know, is this just a painkiller to help us deal with the trauma of death? Could be, because it's very relaxing. It's very euphoric when you get a big DMT release. However, for it to be so prominent in the brain, there are other ways that the body can deal with death, can build a, a painkilling uh, adrenal. Um, so he thinks it connects us to something else, where we came from and where we're going to. And it's very interesting for a scientist to talk about spirit molecule, Science and spirit like to dance around each other and not really acknowledge the existence. But when people have these DMT experiences, and we have it in my class, they are connecting. Some coming out of their body, maybe uh, having a third person experience of the room so they can see themselves from a third person. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they see a bright white light, they go towards the light. Maybe they talk to their soul or talk to a higher power talk to a deceased ancestor or relative, or they have a conversation with God, maybe. Or um, they just have very physical, very cleansing experience. A lot of people cry, some people laugh, some people yawn, a lot of release. And it's unbelievable the experiences that people have had. Some One guy, he took the cigarettes out of his pocket and he threw them in the bin. Straight away, he said, I don't know why I'm doing it. He'd been smoking for 20 years. I don't know why I'm doing this to my body. He was so like agitated and angry with himself. So he had had some, some conversation with his body mm. and basically said, please stop doing this to us. Or, I don't know, the cells in his body or you know, his, his physical. And I talked to him a couple of months later. He never had a desire for another cigarette. Uh, we had another guy who said it was like everyone he knew was just holding him up and just pouring love on him. Wow. And so all of these, you can get it from smoking DMT, of course, ayahuasca, magic mushrooms, LSD. I don't like any of those personally, and I know that there is value from them as a therapy. But when you do it as a breath work, um, you're in control. If you want to go deeper, you can push it deeper. You breathe harder, breathe quicker. If you want, if it's too much for you, you can bring it back a little bit, breathe a bit slower. Well, I, I tried, of course, rebirthing a few times. Yes. So rebirthing, I really enjoy. I try something called vivation from the Yoga Kundalini, mm -hmm. uh, sort of tradition. And I tried maybe another five, seven types of breath work uh, um, over the years. Plus uh, the standard sort of yoga, as you, you call it, you know, Analoma Viloma, yeah. uh, Kapalabhati, all those that are are very kind of, you know, create awareness inside you. They make you connect with the, yourself, your spirit as well. They prepare you for meditation afterwards in a wonderful way, but they don't really push you into a mystical experience mm -hmm. like the DMT might be.
Yeah. So can you explain what is actually the technique? You wanna, if yeah. you want to show it, okay, we can do it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we might float uh, off. Yes. Uh, um, so to do a DMT activation, yogis have actually been doing this for over three and a half thousand years. You know, they didn't know it was DMT that was being released, but they knew that they were connecting from the pineal or from the third eye, as they call it, and the crown chakra, and they were expanding. Mm -hmm. And they were connecting something much, much greater than themselves. So they did it using breath work. It's called Ananda Mandala. So it's like a circle of bliss. Mm -hmm. So they would sit in a circle in the Himalayas. They hold hands and they would breathe. And it's a very deep inhalation and a very sharp exhalation. And okay. you really empty the lungs. It's almost like a basrika, but a little bit, a bit stronger. Yeah. And basrika is already quite intense. But they would do that on every single one of the chakras. Okay, there's no body movements, it's just uh, the nose. It's right? just through the so nose. You don't, you don't have the belly moving? Or... Uh, yeah, you do. You, you squeeze. So you squeeze ah, so the you diagram. Like a kapalabhati or like a like, breath, of, breath of fire. Exactly. Okay. But it's, it's more intense than a kapalabhati because you squeeze. Okay. So it's really, you are actively inhaling and really like sharp exhalation. Yeah. And that, that clears out all of the stale air. The body gets very oxygenated. And I don't know exactly the science of if your body is thinking, oh my God, am I having a near-death experience and that's why I'm really trying to oxygenate my body so quickly. I'm not 100%, that's maybe my hypothesis. Yeah. But as a result, your pineal gland gets activated, the DMT gets activated. As you go up the chakras and you feel that energy come up, and each of these chakras, as you well know, represents a different part of your physiology or your psychology. So from the root, we're talking about our self-esteem. From the sacral, we're talking about our sexuality, our creativity, our passion. The heart chakra, of course, is all about emotions, love, kindness. So whatever happens when you're activating these chakras, if you're having an issue in your life to do with stability or to do with emotion or to do with truth, like in the throat chakra, that will then feed your experience. And the whole point of the practice is it just cleanses you of whatever's going on in your life and you just feel this liberation. And then when you go up through the crown, that's where you're up in the stars or beyond the stars. And everyone has, or not everyone has, but a lot of people have like a non-dual experience mm -hmm. and they don't know where they stop and the rest of the world starts. Yeah. And, um, and then that's fantastic because I think when you get that perspective, you come back out of it and you have a new view of yourself. Sure. You have a new view of your life and you, you ask yourself the right questions, I think, which is, you know, why am I here? What am I doing with my life? You know, am I here to just feed a corporate uh, uh, dragon <laughs> or do I want to make some change or do I want to give back or do I want to help people or, you know, what am what do I actually want to do? Who do I want to be? Yeah, because you have an experience of wholeness and uh, when you come back into your uh, narrow life, uh, the narrow life assumes a different connotation as well. I mean, you are much more than just this story, this guy doing the things that he's doing, right? You had a glimpse of the, of the absolute in a way or another. Yeah. And for people particularly that are very science-minded and they are very mind and body, you know, having this kind of glimpse of something else can really be life changing. And that's what happened to me. You know, I was very scientifically minded, you know, still am to a certain extent. I, I value science for what it is. But I also believe and know, not just believe, that there is something beyond body and mind, which is a spiritual aspect. And having a mystical experience or a glimpse of the whole and on dual experience is exactly what I also had back in the days, you know, not through breath work, through other things, but uh, these are wonderful tools indeed. And once you get a glimpse of it, it changes your life a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, as long as you don't get attached and seeking it all the time, because that could be also, you know, an ego story. But it can be very fascinating and it can be very healing as well because you let go of, uh, of stress, as you said, you know, you let go of identifications that maybe are not very useful in life, you know. And, and that's what you do, right? You're yeah. teaching it. That's wonderful, I think. Uh, do you use any music during the, the Abs class? Absolutely. What yeah. kind of music do you use? I have, a, I have a very nice playlist that I... Uh, align with each of the chakras mm -hmm. so it starts a bit more bassy 
for the root and then we bring it up very nice for the heart it's quite emotional and then for the crown it it really helps spread you up um, but it's very nice music music is a big part of my life uh, so I love I love kind of combining how do you bring the right soundtrack to these meditations as well because listening to music is a meditation in itself you know and also it evokes certain emotions and certain feelings and you can change your mood with music and so on so yeah we have a, it's one of my biggest requests at the end is people always go can i do this again where can i do it online and then also can i have your playlist yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are always like can we have the playlist can we have the playlist makes sense i mean it's, uh, it's the resonance it's principle of resonance in tantric yeah. yoga whereby anything in the world has a certain frequency but of course, certain frequencies are more obvious than others, yeah. and Hollywood knows it very well. So if you have <laughs> the hero going to war, you have to tum, boom, 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 a certain kind of music, right? Yeah. Whilst if you have, you know, the, at the end of the movie, they're kiss, they're meeting and kissing in a passionate love, and then you have la 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 la, you got a love-like yeah. music, right? Yeah. And it's uh, obvious to everybody, but maybe not so consciously. Once you start studying it, it's amazing because it's part of my journey. I also learned, uh, you know, how to associate uh, sounds with colors, mm -hmm. yes, because every vibration, you know, is different and it stimulates a different chakra, a different emotion. Yeah. It's wonderful. There's so much knowledge there that is very ancient. Nobody really taps into yeah. it. Yeah. But you're a DJ as well, right? So I am a DJ. So you so do ecstatic dance? I do ecstatic dance. I mean, I've been DJing since the uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, started in the clubs in Manchester, in the warehouses, playing more like rave style. And then as I grew up and then on this kind of spiritual journey and grew out of the club scene, uh, discovered ecstatic dance. And it was amazing because I got to dust off the turntables and it's like, okay, this is amazing. In an ecstatic dance, we are dancing to some, you know, nice music, nice beats where you know, too, uh, too old to go to the club till four in the morning and it's dark and it's sweaty and different smoky, energy. wrong side of town, very, very different energy, a bit, can be a bit scary. Uh, you gotta get a taxi in the middle of the night, get dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Ecstatic dance, we usually do it in the daytime, it's very light, there's no drugs, no alcohol, no uh, external substances, it's you in your body and you, you get the opportunity to hear the, the music from the clubs, but in a really safe place, in a bright place. Um, and so I bring that kind of clubbing element into the ecstatic journey. I mean, when I used to go clubbing, I would never drink anyway. I would just have Red Bull. Uh, and I was never really into the clubbing <laughs> drugs at all. I just drink Red Bull and I go energy. So for me, it, it was just like a natural step because I love the music so much. And so what I'm trying to create on the dance floor with my ecstatic dances, uh, I do them together with my partner, Mona Vogel. She does the cacao ceremony, which stimulates the body. I mean, th there is some stimulation of cacao. It's pure chocolate. And, um, but that's amazing because it makes people feel the love. It makes people energized. And then when I play the music, it really takes people on this journey. It goes yeah. through all of the emotions, gets people into their body. They dance out, you know. Uh, whatever's going on in that day, you know, or in that poor period of your life. And I think there's nothing like the therapy of dance. You know, people come to me and they say, oh, medita I struggle to sit long time for meditation or I can't control my mind and all this stuff. But with dance, everybody can dance. Yeah. And everybody, you know, you hear the music, whether you think you're a good dancer or not, you can dance. And this is the one thing that I love about ecstatic dance is you know we get so many people come who've never danced they've maybe danced at weddings uh, but they've been drunk or you know i've never danced sober and um oh, i'm not sure is is it okay if like i can just sit there and wait and i say yeah sure just listen to music if you don't feel the need to dance just sit and wait you can always meditate in the corner or you can always sit and you know every time from the first song everyone just goes and they all go for it. And at the end, it's always like, I feel love, I feel blessed, I feel great, I feel my body, I feel free. And that for me, it's, it's fun. The whole point of the ecstatic dance is super fun. But when you hear people who like have actually even a spiritual experience in the dance, that's like the cherry on top. Yeah, that's what happened to me at the beginning when I was starting ecstatic dance about seven years ago in Copangan. 
uh, I treated it like a, a gym class almost. Yeah. I would just go and move mechanically, you know? <laughs> and the first two, three times I did a workout. I was with people, so it was interesting, but I didn't really go anywhere, right? But I think after three or four times, I had this moment where the body started moving on its own. I had an altered state of consciousness. I was part of the whole group of people, you know, mm. seamlessly, you know, dancing and, and connecting with each other, you know, from an energetic perspective. And I had this feeling of wholeness. Wasn't as powerful as, you know, it would be through a breath work yeah. or something else that I'd done, but it would, f you know, leave me very, very connected and joyful and relaxed and, you know, amazing, you know. But it's something that you have to try because uh, as you said, maybe particularly if you're not very much in the body, you're a very mind kind of yeah. guy, you know, girl, uh, you need, uh, you know, a little bit more than just one session maybe, but sooner or later it will happen. And it's wonderful when it does. Yeah. And all these practices bring joy, as you said, bring happiness, right? Because yeah. that's how we started this interview. Yeah. So the theme of happiness, right? So what is happiness to you first of all yeah. and uh, how can you be more happier in your life on a day-to-day -day basis yeah that's a great question um for me happiness is whatever it means for every individual person you know i see so many clients they always say i want to be happy i want to be happy or i want to be happier or you we rate their happiness how are you at a 10 some people might say a four some people might say seven or eight and you ask them well, what would make you a 10 and so many people will say you know, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just have uh, enough money that I can buy a house, or if I can just get that next promotion at work, or if I could just, if I could just. And I see people the next day who are maybe five years down the line and they have these things. And then I say to them, hey, how happy are you? Let's rate you from four to five, one to 10, how are you? And it's like, you must be happy because the person I spoke to yesterday wanted the things that you have. So surely you are, and then they want some other things. Yeah. And so for me, what I realized, and it's, it's a classic one, isn't it? That it's desire is the key to unhappiness. So if we turn it on a set rather than what makes you happy, what makes you unhappy is desire. And so if you want something to be the way that it is not right now, then you're going to have an unhappiness. So for me, what I realized was the secret to my happiness is to just accept. If you accept things as they are, you have no expectation and you just let whatever happens, happens, then that's where you get the happiness. Because if I want something to be some, some other way, if I could only, then I'm, I'm creating that unhappiness. So for me, it's about gratitude. It's about uh, not looking at what I haven't got and being miserable about it. It's just, my God, look at what I do have and I'm really grateful for it. So I become happy. So there's a big part about gratitude. There's a big part about expectations, having low expectations. If you expect a lot and you don't get it, again, you're going to be unhappy. If you have low expectations, it's more likely that you will outweigh those expectations and that will create a level of happiness. And that's a big thing, I think, with people. You know, we always get so disappointed with people. And why are we disappointed? Because they behave in a way that we, uh, contrary to what we expected. Mm -hmm. You say, can you believe that guy? He did this. Well... If you expected him to do something and he didn't do it, then you're going to be annoyed at him. But if you have a low expectation, yeah, well, okay. I didn't know what to expect of his behavior. And you're saying that's how he behaved. Okay. So I think if you, if you clear yourself of expectations, then that's another way that I, that's a real easy way into happiness for me. Accepting things how they are. And then I think being positive, you know, you can look at the world in two ways. You know, you can look at it and let it get you down or you can be look at it and, and you get up. It's how you respond rather than you know, what the state of affairs is. And there is studies on this. You know, people who are optimistic live longer than people who are pessimistic. People who pray live, I think, on average eight years longer. And I'm not, I don't know if that's because, because they're praying to a God and the God is saving them for eight years longer, giving them less disease or whatever. But I think it's actually more a level of faith, you know, in terms of believing that there can be some salvation. And that actually helps elongate your life and therefore lives a lot healthier. Um, I spent a lot of time studying the blue zones. I don't know if you've heard of the blue sure, zones, of course. Of course yeah. 
these are the five places where people live the longest. And I've been to three of them. It's a, a little life mission to try and find the other two. The key there is they are the oldest people in the world and they're some of the happiest. And the way they are the happiest is a number of reasons. Um, but I think principally they have purpose in their life. Um, and then they also have very, very little stress and a lot of good family values. And I think these yeah. simple things are actually the keys to happiness. Yes, and also having an internal uh, life as well, you know, because many people are always desiring what is external, you know, so I, if I had this, if I had that, you know, and there's very little focus on being whole internal instead. If you start having a spiritual life, means uh, you can effectively get rid of everything which is external and connect with uh, your internal self, so your spiritual side, Everything assumes different connotation, right? Everything gets a little bit easier and more relaxed because once you're in, what's out doesn't really matter. So it's yeah, uh, you know yeah, it's easy yeah. to say you know I don't want to desire anything, I don't want to, I don't care, you know, or maybe I'm not so attached to things. But how do you actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis? So my practice is, if particularly if I'm having a stressful day or there's something triggering me outside because things don't work the, sh the way they should. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just go back inside, you know, and uh, it's not like bypassing uh, the life problems that I have because yeah, I still want to put energy into projects uh, and into, you know, maybe creating more harmony or having more things outside. I'm not saying that it's, everything needs to be discounted as, uh, you know, irrelevant, but just having this measure of detachment so that you still do things that maybe you think you're compelled to do in a way or another, you're predisposed to do maybe. Yeah, yeah. So for instance, you know, teaching meditation, you want to have people to come to your class if they don't come, well, tomorrow they'll come, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, uh, so it's, a, it's really, because sometimes people say, oh yeah, then you can just live like, uh, you know, a saint in a, in a cave totally disengaged with uh, the world, but that's not a good life, you know? Yeah. So it's finding the balance between uh, having a project, because you also have projects and things that you want to do, right? Just maybe you're not so desperately attached to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you raise a really great point there, Luca. If we go and sit in a cave, it's actually quite easy to be happy if you're going to just meditate 10 hours a day, someone brings you some dal, you have your food taken care of, you have your shelter taken care of, and you can just sit in bliss you know, that's fine. But when you come down on the cave, you have to engage in society. And as soon as you engage in society, there are stresses. There are people, you know, relationships, friendships. There, you have to queue up. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to uh, uh, pay for your food. You have to find a way of paying that. You, you have to get a job. You get a job, there's stresses and, you know, and you have clients and so on. So, it's very easy, I think, to be happy in a cave, and it's very difficult, actually, to be happy in a, a societal uh, norms. Yeah. Um, in including all these narratives that are really, really damaging, you know, like in the news, etc., where on one side, you know, we are supposed to become all millionaires and billionaires yeah. if you only put in an effort, you know. On the other side, we are all victims of sort these days, you know, and. Uh, and then, you know, the world is coming to an end because, you know, there's global warming, there's wars, there's, there's pandemics. <laughs> you know, the whole, the whole story is not really conducive for mental health, right? Yeah. Well, I, th I mean, if you look at the news, and I, I try to... I, I, I watch as much news as possible to keep me informed, but I don't... But without getting too involved with it. Because when you look at those news stories, there is nothing really nice there. You know, and actually a lot of it is, uh, if it was a movie, it, it's 18 plus, you know, uh, very graphic. I think as I got more, I guess, sensitive to, you know, you see war, you see uh, people getting abandoned, losing their homes, murders. Uh, the resonance is very low and negative. Yeah, you can't help but feeling down and depressed. It, it brings you down. So in some ways, the least the least amount of news you consume, I think the better, because it's never really a happy story. Yeah, Maybe, it's... you know, the cultural news or the sporting news, that's at least where you might actually find a good news story. But the main headlines, the prominent news, it's all negative. And you see the way our politicians behave, it's yeah. unbelievable how lacking in integrity they are. Okay, so there are many, many places you've been to, because yes. it seems like you'll be a globetrotter, and that. also there are many places you could go and live. Why do you love Copangan still? Why do I love Copangan? 
Um, well, I grew up with this island, so I came for the party and then I stayed for the beauty of it and everything uh, that it has to offer. Uh, like I say, you can start with the party scene, then you've discovered the yoga scene. There's such a spiritual element of this island. There's such beautiful nature in the island. Uh, it's so green. We have such jungle with coconut trees and monkeys and lizards and, you know, incredible at snakes, <laughs> incredible animals. Um, so you can get that connection to nature. And then I almost have, and it's hard to describe, but like a, almost like a relationship with the island where it's almost like testing me. I, and it, you come here and you have, you, you get tested in ways, you get everything confronted with you. Mm. And, and I, I don't, I, there are some other places in the world where you get that, but here I find I just develop more as a result because I just, I don't know, I see myself more. And it's really funny actually, because I had this conversation about two days ago with somebody who said, you don't seem to travel so much anymore. You used to travel, and I used to travel a lot, both for business and for pleasure. It was my biggest passion. And I think once you realize that I'm living in the place that I would always travel to, <laughs> there's no reason to leave it. And so, I mean, there are some other places I like to go, uh, but since being here full time, I just really enjoying my life more, enjoying being the place that I love to be. And I find I have developed as the island has developed and uh, it keeps, it just keeps evolving as I evolve. So hopefully that will continue and I will stay here uh, and keep going with it. But there's, it's a beautiful place. And it, I think for everybody, it's not so much come to Gopanyang and live in Gopanyang. I'm not sure we have so much space for everybody, but more live in a place that you feel comfortable and at ease and that's nourishing you in whatever it is that you like doing, both for work and for play. I'd say it's my biggest thing. That's lovely. Well, thank you very much for coming today and, you know, telling us your story. Adrian, thank, thank you, you very Luca. much. Kapunka. Kapunka. Thank you so much, Luca. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me.